I want to start by telling you a little bit about one of the organizations we spent a pretty good amount of time with. It's a public school in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States, right in the city. Um, and when we went for a visit a few years ago, we'd been keeping our eye on it, and we knew a bit about it, but we went for a visit and uh, to spend some real time and to talk to people. We started gathering people in groups of three or four, digging into their what was happening at the school. And in almost every single group, somebody started crying. It happened over and over again, and usually then the tears would hit more than one person as we walked around the school. And this is primarily the teachers and the staff that, that we were talking to, although we also talked to the students and we talked to parents as well, and some external stakeholders. I don't know how much any of you guys know about Baltimore, but it's a pretty typical kind of Eastern blue collar uh, US city that's, that has lots going for it, but it struggles with lots of things as well. So it certainly had lots of depopulation. You can see all the boarded up houses here. The education system is struggling. Um, unemployment is high. Plenty of violent crime um, among the highest in the nation. Um, plenty of uh, issues with drugs and with public health in general. So the school is located in an area that's not a particularly easy area to start doing your, your work around the social purpose. Um, and if you think about what anybody who's, who's going into, really anywhere in the world, is going into to start to work with social purpose, and the number of kinds of institutional patterns and habits and mindsets and structures and policies and issues that they're going to be dealing with one way or another, it becomes quite overwhelming. So if you, it, it's not just about going to teach an eight-year-old how to read in this context, right? You, you have to think about health and education, economics, race, technology, culture, the politics going on, all of those things intersecting. This giant system that you're in the middle of trying to do something different. And that's quite, the, I'm sure it's quite, it's the same in Cape Town, it's the same anywhere in the world. And when you really think about the number of forces, the number of patterns, the history behind them, the number of assumptions, the, how deeply all of these kinds of things are institutionalized in the worlds in which we operate with social purpose, anybody who's uh, any kind of thinking human being should, should run away screaming and, and immediately you know, look for a, a cabin in the woods. Because it's overwhelming and it's hard for us to imagine how we could create any kind of real change in that welter of institutional uh, difficulties. The question that we were asking people at the school that started all the crying was, how is this place different from other schools that you've been around? And that's when the tears would start, because they were so happy. And they would say, I'm more excited and engaged than I've ever been. They would say, uh, I feel more creative. They'd say, I feel more alive. they say, I feel like I, I'm, I'm finally learning how to teach after many years of teaching. They would say, I feel connected to the kids in ways I couldn't imagine. They would say, I feel like I'm treated as a human being, a whole person here, and that people accept me for who I am, for my strengths and my weaknesses, and I can bring those to the table for what I'm doing. They would say, this is the best place I ever worked. For me, this is, it's a small school. It's a small example. But for me, it's a kind of institutional miracle that you can go into an environment that is so much bigger than the handful of people working in this school, and that you can create serious cracks in that institutional fabric, that you can actually alter something over just a few years that, and make it profoundly different than the experience of most people in that same system, and that you can deal with all of those forces of politics and gender and race and crime and health and all of those kinds of things without, of course, being an expert in any of them, maybe one part of one of them, that's an institutional miracle to me. These are the kinds of places we've been hanging out with, sticking our noses into, volunteering with, uh, in some cases doing formal research with, over the last 10 years, saying, how do you do that? What do these places have to teach us about how you can create that kind of deep change? Um, and even if we figure that out, we know that most places like this you know, they have their moment and then it fades. You know, it, it works well two, three, four, five years, the energy's high, people are starting something maybe, there's a great leader, all of the usual excuses we have for why something can only last a certain while, and then it fades out and it's not the same anymore. So how do you sustain that? We started getting really intrigued by places that were sustaining it over five, 10, 15 years, over two, three, four leaders. Boards of directors flipping, volunteers flipping, staff flipping, Cir external circumstances changing, economics going up and down. And yet these new patterns were being institutionalized in a healthy way somehow so that they were persisting. And then how do you scale it? Because we can all come up with a few examples anyway of change that has been sustained, 
and people have done really amazing things, and it's lasted over generations. And then if you have anything to do with kind of social change, social innovation, you're kind of going, what, what's wrong with everybody else? Why aren't you doing this? Hey, the city just developed this amazing green uh, waste you know, landfill. It's like a park, and like, why isn't every city doing that? The economics are great, they save money, they do, you can run down the list, and, but it doesn't spread. Right? So, so, so people are starting to, to say, we need to know more about scale, and we can't just kind of blame the usual, oh, we need more leadership, or we need more this, or we need more that, or we don't have enough resources. There must be better answers than that. So these places, I think, although they're small, are starting to teach us, or at least open up some doorways, I think that are quite exciting to rethinking how we think about scale. So the punchline, for all of this, is that we've been seeing consistently one answer to all three of these questions in the organizations we've been working with. The same answer, the simple-minded answer, the answer that I think actually could be revolutionary, not in theory, not in the room that we're sitting in, but in practice. You'll notice that when I started talking about how different the school was, I wasn't saying here's their curriculum is amazing, although it's quite interesting. Um, you know, their structure is, is great, it's so different. How their funding works, um, you know, what kinds of kids they have, all of these sorts of programmatic things. I didn't focus on those. I talked to you about the experience of the teachers and the staff themselves, of the people who were doing the work. But that was kind of the shift that I was highlighting. All of those other things actually are quite innovative in the school, and that they're, they're continually experimenting. In fact, I've never seen, I've rarely seen a place so kind of alive with experimenting in its own, its own life, and like, well, what if we tweak the curriculum this way, and what if we try the, this way of parent engagement, and what if we move the classroom around this way, and like, really, within the constraints of a quite a formalized and bureaucratized uh, school system, like most, large school system with 200 schools in it, um, within the constraints of that, a little more freedom than normal because it's a, it's a charter school, but most of those constraints are still there. Um, being quite innovative, and yet what I focused on was not those innovations, not the social innovations, but the experience of the people doing the work. And that has been the thing that we've seen consistently across the most alive, most engaging, most socially innovative places that we've worked with, is that they pay deep and sustained attention to the experiences as they're happening of the people who are doing the work. They don't just ask, what are we doing? And they don't even just ask, how are we doing it? Which is a whole other question. They spend a lot of time asking, how are we experiencing it? Not how are they, how are we? How are we experiencing it? This is the part where it's embarrassing. That seems to me too simple. And almost, doesn't everybody do that? In my own experience, no. In the social change sector, actually moving around lots and lots of other organizations that really don't feel like this, the more generalized experience is that there's quite a gap between what we're trying to do out there and how our organizations feel, how they look, how they taste. You know, we're trying to create community. Do, does my nonprofit feel like a community? We're trying to create health or learning. Does this feel like a healthy place, a place of learning? Does a school feel like a place of learning for the teachers? Um, we're trying to advocate for democracy and, and social unity. Do we have democracy? Do we have a real living democracy inside of the organization that we're working? In general, as we've talked to people and in our own experience before doing research, we, we worked in the, in the field for quite a while, there's a big disconnect very often between what we're trying to create and how our organizations are. So it turns out that when you actually just start, not even necessarily working with experience, but literally just servicing it, just sharing it in a day-to-day -day way with the people in the room, some amazing things start to happen. How do they do this? There are a thousand ways that they do this. And by experience, I should say, I don't just mean um, you know, how you, your emotions, although that's part of it, but all the kinds of things that are happening inside the human beings that are doing the work. Their aspirations, their beliefs, their values, things they're struggling with, their curiosities, things they're excited about, their passions, including their ideas, all of that sort of stuff that's kind of going on inside. I would say that most people don't actually have a very good idea of what's happening inside of the heads and the hearts of the people they're sitting around the table with in a given moment, or in a broader sense. In these places, they, they're kind of constantly checking in with that. And there's no one programmatic way to do it. It's more of a, a change of, of intention, a paradigm. So when you think about what do we want to create, you don't just think about what are the outcomes we want to create that we can see, but what are the experiences that we want to create. The school, this school, I should mention the name of it, Southwest Baltimore Charter School, was literally founded 
with this one simple idea. We want to create a place that feels different for the people in it. We don't like the way we felt. We want it to feel different. We don't know what that means. And we, don't, we don't know what curriculum we're going to use. We, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we have no idea, and we're probably completely ill-equipped to do it, but that's what we want to do. And into that inquiry, they started bringing people, bringing people, and constantly tuning back into how that is. So you know, you're thinking about a project you're planning, you know, an event you're going to hold, something that you want to do. You don't just say, what do we want to happen out of this, but how do we want to feel while we're doing it? When you're evaluating something, you look into, how was that for you? How was that for us? Not just did it accomplish the goals that we set out. You look in at all those things, too. They don't get rid of all their normal goals and all the work that they're doing. But they're constantly looking at what's actually happening inside of the people that are doing this work. We took to calling this practice inscaping, borrowing a term from the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, kind of the idea that simply surfacing, sharing, asking, trying to figure out how people were feeling and thinking about stuff as the work was going on, and shaping the work around that. And it turned out that there were two kinds of dimensions to that. And we, we highlight them not to be academic and cute, but because they seem to have really different effects. One dimension was people who were sharing the experiences of the work itself. How are we feeling about what we're doing? What are other ideas we might have? What are some of our worries, anxieties? How are our relationships going in work? Um, you know, what am I struggling with? Um, all, all those kinds of things around the work itself were coming out more than, than it was typical. Uh, the other dimension had to do with sharing experiences beyond the work. You know, having, giving you a sense of who I am as a whole person, what my life might be like outside work. Not the whole thing, not my whole biography, but just the sense that I have other values, I have other priorities, I have other interests, I have, there other, I have other circumstances. Maybe the reason I'm not you know, plugged into this meeting is because of stuff happening out in my life outside. It turned out that, that as you get good at sharing the experiences of the work itself, that really has a kind of creative thrust to it. Divergent ideas come. People are unafraid to say, I'm thinking about this differently. Work relationships, that uh, conflicts are kind of aired, opened out, and you, you get some momentum and some energy from that. Um, you learn how to collaborate better, and you're constantly pushing at the, at the seams of what it is you think you're doing. It's a very catalytic energy to do that. On the other hand, when you're sharing experiences beyond work, you get into kind of a meaning dimension. People would, would, were able to, to think more fully about what, is the, what do they want, what is the purpose of this. I'm a, I'm a person whose, whose goal is not just to make this organization thrive, I have a broader sense of what matters in the world. And so it, it's, it's harder there to get totally caught up in the narrow organizational goals, and you keep sort of testing those goals out of a larger sense of meaning. And we actually see a lot of organizations kind of get stuck a bit on one or the other side of this. So <clears throat> a lot of nonprofits, a lot of explicit social change organizations kind of live down here. That is, they're very, they're actually very good at making room for the whole person. We know a lot about each other as people. We accept that you're not here just to do the work. Uh, we share lots of different aspects of our lives. But this was a big revelation to us. We see a lot over and over again that they're actually not great at sharing their experiences of the work itself. They're hesitant to voice alternative ideas or things that maybe they're feeling kind of a yearning to move in a different direction than the group, than the idea, the ideology of their organization. They're very hesitant to talk to kind of service any kind of conflict or relational issues. And so they can feel very communal, have a great feeling in one way, but they can also have a real difficult time being innovative. They can get kind of stuck and feel like, you know, we all love each other, and why aren't we getting somewhere a little more? Conversely, you see this in any kind of organization anywhere, but this is a pattern I think you'll see more often in for-profit organizations that are oriented toward innovation. They're out to make new things, new products. And they actually, if they're innovative, they often tend to be quite good at sharing the work experiences. I'll tell you my older idea, and I will get into it, and we'll, you know, and I'm actually, I'm really excited about this, and I don't know why yet, it's just intuition. Leave me alone, I'm gonna go off and, you know, you think of high tech companies, they, they are often like really, a lot, there's a lot of that going on. And relationships, if we're having a fight, let's have the fight, you know, let's, let's really, I'm gonna tell you how I'm experiencing. But there's a lot less of the idea that you actually exist not just to make this next microchip, you know, you exist for many. So they could be creating the great microchips, but it becomes much not so connected to kind of a broader sense of values and meaning, and so on. everything gets subsumed into the organizational goals. So on the one hand, you've got kind of innovation without a lot of social awareness, and on the other hand, you've got a lot of social awareness without a lot of innovation. You know, the social innovation space tends to be up there. Organizations that can move, not perfectly, but can move in the direction of sharing all of these kinds of experiences. One uh, social movement that I, I particularly like to think about who was pretty good at this, um, 
in really in both dimensions was the women's movement um, in the United States um, and in the UK throughout the 20th century. I like to I like to read about them because they were they were very explicitly looking at from an experiential lens. We, we're not just trying to change policy. We're not just trying to change social attitudes out there. We're going to experiment with what's happening inside of our organizations and our movement groups. We're going to try to create movement groups that are more participatory, that are less oppressive. We're going to experiment with ways of holding meetings. We're going to rotate executive directors. We're going to have new policies. We're going to develop new language that's not oppressive. So they were thinking hard about that. There's a problem, I think, with how they end up doing that. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. But that being said, Given that focus, I, I think you could argue, you certainly could have a plausible debate about whether or not they were the most successful movement of this social movement of the 20th century. They gotta be in the running. They have to be you know, in, the, in the mix of, of movements that have, have had the profoundest kind of, at this point, worldwide change. We'll come back to them in a second. So, so that's the punchline of it. And we can talk later in the kind of Q&A and, and when we're thinking with each other about what does this look like in practice. We're wary of giving you the five steps to inscaping, because then it's not really inscaping, and it's not about the experience of the people actually in the room, it's just uh, some mechanical steps to follow. Um, so it's really more about the intention, but certainly organizations develop ways in meetings or ways in, you know, in their planning product. Uh, the key for me has been, another big insight, it's kind of coming from someone interested in organizational development, that most of this work is not happening through big interventions, retreats team bonding exercises, all that kind of stuff. It's just a normal day to day. Oh, we're writing a grant, you know, we're trying to make a sale. Uh, we're, we're just answering the phone from a client or a customer. We're answering emails. It's in the normal day to day work. We're sitting around and we're talking about the work. We're not talking about how we, you know, we're not having a therapy session. We're actually doing the work and while we're doing the work, we're sharing our experiences on these dimensions. That's been a big aha for me. Um, but what, what really starts to get exciting is so I'm claiming, you do this, you'll change the world. I'm telling you right now, I'm claiming that. Do this, you'll change the world. Why? This is what we've been spending a lot of time thinking about and talking to people about lately. Why should this be true? We can see why if we all share our experiences, we might feel better. Maybe we'll like each other a little more. Maybe not. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there'll be a little more energy. Maybe we won't feel kind of so imprisoned. But why isn't this just a recipe for kind of feeling good but not necessarily getting anything done in the world? Why isn't this just an excuse for indulging ourselves in our, in our work, in our organizations? After all, the big changes we want to seek are out there. You know, we need to change the world, not just our little space. The argument here is you change your little space, you change the world. Really. And that the, the kind of institutional innovation we've been talking about is coming from this. Why? Um, why would experiential organizing help us do these three things? I'll tell you about one other organization uh, that, that gives uh, one really nice answer to this. It's Kafunda Village in Zimbabwe. And we spent several months there last year. And Kafunda Village is a, a grassroots organization slash community. It's an actual village, people living in it, started by uh, local people who wanted to experiment with sustainable ways of living. They wanted to experiment <coughs> environmentally, so they developed uh, and practiced ways of uh, building eco-housing and waste management, water, energy, uh, permaculture, all those kinds of things. And then also socially, governance. How do we as a community <coughs> govern ourselves? How do we collaborate meaningfully? Um, how do we bust old patterns of authority, domination, apathy, all those kinds of things? How do we do that so that we feel like we're active participants and collaborative <coughs> participants in our own lives? An amazing little place. The people live there and they also work with um, a number of other communities in Zimbabwe. And again, it's all local, conceived of, and, and run by the people living there, most of whom are living on almost no money, uh, many of whom have, have uh, you know, not had university education or worked for fancy nonprofits or done any, had any of the usual kinds of training that we think you need to start something like this. Great place, you should go visit next time you're feeling like a little Zimbabwe uh, trip. Anyway, um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, the, the village, the kind of main people <coughs> in the village got together to, to think about a particular issue. For, it's been around for about 10 years now, the Funda Village, and for most of that time, the finances, the funding, the external funding that they would get, the, the management of, of the financial health of the village had been more or less handled by um, a, a few people, a small number of people who did have more formal university training, um, who did have more experience with that kind of universe, who felt comfortable.
talking to outside funders, who felt comfortable writing grants, who felt comfortable crunching numbers and working with spreadsheets, et cetera. A small number of people, um, a couple of whom, the sort of main ones, didn't live in the village um, at the time. It was fine, it worked fine, but they were still full-hearted participants for need. Um, so there's nothing wrong with it. But the village uh, started saying, you know, I think we want to take more ownership of this. We want to, we want to, we want to manage this more ourselves. It feels too fragile having it depend on one or two people. Who knows what happens with them or where they go in their lives. And this should be part of our sustainable governance. Good. So let's set up a finance team. Great. Everyone agree? Yes. Who wants to be on the finance team? Dead son. Everyone agree? We're going all the reasons go over and over again. Sure. Volunteer. Nothing. People started getting frustrated. You started feeling like, hey, look at everyone here is just talking and they're not willing to do anything. Talking to talk, you know, walking the walk. This is this is the problem. This is what happened. Normal projections we get when people don't behave the way we think they should be behaving, because we're sure we understand what's going on in their messed up minds. Right. So, this organization was developing its kind of inscaping experience. At one point, just stop, stop the conversation. Can we just go around the room? There might be ten people in the room at this point, kind of working on this. And can we just see what, what's everyone, what's going on inside everyone right now? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Okay. So we go around the room and start hearing things like, you know, I actually would like to be on the finance team, but I, don't, I, I feel intimidated and you'd have to, if I were to do it, you'd have to accept that it's a learning experience for me. I don't have the expertise. And if you could accept that, that I'm coming in as a learner, then I would do it. Okay, yeah, we can accept that. Um, other people, well, I, I, I don't know if I, I I'm too comfortable taking that kind of leadership, but I think it would be interesting. But I don't want people to feel like the finance team is the boss of the, of the, the village. I'm sensitive to that. Okay, well, let's be on the team and we'll work with that. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not really, I don't have enough time. I feel overcommitted right now, to, to, but I'd like to support the team, so I don't want to be on it. But I'd like to help in these ways. So pretty soon you go around the room. We had enough volunteers for the finance team. Other people talking about how they could support the team. This took about 10 minutes. Now this may seem like, I think this is like a mind-blowing story. <laughs> and I hope you don't yet, but I hope you're about to. It, it, at first glance, whatever, it's just an operational issue, right? Well, we need a team, we need some volunteers. <coughs> okay, here's a clever little technique to get them to, to volunteer, basically. We'll put them on the spot, we'll go around, whatever. Why is this at the heart of social innovation? Here's why to me. If you think about what was happening in that room, what those blocks were. Those were deeply institutionalized blocks. There was a lot of stuff in there. It was around class, it was around race, it was around education, it was around uh, leadership <coughs> and authority and what that meant. It was around safety and is it safe for me to kind of voice and take this role. It was around the same kind of crazy institutional mess. And the people were living those things out. One of the great sociological insights around institutions and how they work every day is that we are the carriers of this stuff. It's our behaviors, our mindsets, our, our ways of thinking and behaving that carry all this stuff, and that most of that is submerged. We don't, we're not really that conscious about it. So if you want us to sit around and have like a nice analytical talk about institutional change, we're not gonna get that far, because we don't really understand that much about how even we take in these institutions, let alone how our neighbors do. However, we do. And if you start servicing people's experiences, all of a sudden, you're bringing these things to light in a way that you can work with. People saying, I feel afraid of this, or I'm excited about this, but this. All of those things started coming to the surface in that 10 minutes in such a way that you could shift them. And it was the same thing in the school. It's the same thing in many places th that we've been in. Um, where literally, in 10 minutes, what happened in that room in Zimbabwe was they broke patterns, patterns that were hundreds of years old in some cases. They were life patterns for many of the people in the room about what they could and couldn't do, what they were allowed to, what their expertise was, you know, what kind of authority they could take, how they could collaborate in their own lives. Deep patterns which you could spend your whole life banging on the wall, trying to change those. And in 10 minutes, they shifted. And they stayed shifted. They stayed shifted. That, to me, is social innovation. That, to me, is institutional change. So what we're seeing, kind of the, I think the fundamental key is that the institutions that we're trying to shift are in the room with us right now. We need to draw on our experiences, not just to make ourselves feel better while we're doing the work, although that's great, but because that's the access, that's the most immediate access we have to the things that we are trying to change. And this is not a nice theory, this is in practice. 
what seems to happen. This is what allows that school in Baltimore, Southwest Baltimore Charter School, to do the same thing within fairly gentle strokes in just a few years to completely shift many of those seemingly intractable patterns. The second thing that happens here, in addition to that kind of institutional insight that you get, is that you unleash a whole lot of resources and energy. So you're finding, as we went around the circle in Kafunda, you know, well, there are a lot of people actually that want to contribute in different ways that maybe weren't the ways we were thinking of. So one of the reactions we often get is, oh, this feels like heavy work, like you've got to be talking all the time about your experiences. <coughs> we don't have time for that, man. We don't. This does not require extra resources. This <coughs> liberates resources. This will give you more of all the things you think you need, time, energy, money even. Start talking to funders this way and watch what happens. This is not a burden on the organization. This is a way of actually increasing the resources, which many of which are already in the room. And of course, if I say the institutions in the room, the more we start to take an experiential approach with even people outside of that organization or other stakeholders, the more we're increasing that institutional microcosm um, that we have. So the more we're talking to funders and other stakeholders and, and, and politicians, et cetera, in the work we're doing in an experiential way, then you're getting other pieces of the institutional puzzle. But a surprising amount of it's just in the small little teams that you're normally working with. A surprising amount of it's already carried there, and you can start there and get a long way and prepare yourself to then be much more institutionally engaged, um, <coughs> experientially engaged, sorry, with the people that you're starting to work with. So I think that actually answers a lot of why this experiential approach isn't indulgent, but in fact is transformative. Briefly, I just want to say a couple of things now about the sustaining and the, and the scaling. And again, so we, we could see this very often in startups, places with new energy, new leadership, some big change management, something happens, you know, some big intervention, and you get a good year or two out of it. We've been looking at these places that, that are sustaining it, and it's wanting to say, how are they managing to do that? And again, the answer is, lies very much in the experiential approach they're taking. So I want to go back to the women's movement really quickly. As I said, they were very uh, experimental in how those organizations ran. Ex rotating executive directors, sitting in circles and each taking their turn, etc. And for quite a while, this, these were transformative practices. I was reading some work by Francesca Poletta, a, a social movement scholar, spent a lot of time interviewing people that had been involved in the women's movement in the States in the 60s and in the 70s. And she said what was interesting was they, were, they had very mixed feelings. They were very proud of what they'd accomplished, rightly so. At the same time, there was a kind of bitterness and a frustration and many of them described what had started as these really life-changing and life-affirming practices gradually becoming these heavy kinds of things that were keeping them from feeling like they could be really authentic. Maybe I don't want to rotate to be an executive director. Oh, it's not my thing. I'm not that good at it. Yeah, I like you. You keep doing it. I don't do those things. You know, maybe we sat in a circle and we all went around and had our speech, but I don't feel like anyone listens to me actually anymore. But I can't say that. I can't say that because this is what participation looks like. So what happened was, I think like almost every other social movement in history, they started associating kind of what they were trying to create experientially with particular forms of <coughs> behavior, particular roles, ideologies, programs, particular kinds of language, policies, and started seeing that as the thing itself that they were trying to create. And that's what became institutionalized. That's the form track. We all know, if we think about it, that democracy is not just a bunch of forms of voting and, and you know, it's actually a feeling of participating fully in the life of, of my community, having voice. It's not an easy thing to get to, but we know the difference. There are a lot of countries where people vote that don't feel that democratic. People don't feel very engaged. They don't feel like they have power. They don't feel like they have voice. We know the difference between form and experience, but we often get so excited when we discover new forms that work for a while experientially, that we get stuck in those. And then when they stop working, for whatever reason, they get a little old and stale, the people change, the times change, whatever it might be, we stay stuck on those forms. And we lose all innovative capacity because of it. So in the places we're looking at that are sustaining this over time, they don't make that mistake. Well, they do. Everybody does. But they don't make it so much. And they're continually interrogating those kinds of forms against the actual experiences of the people there. Is this form still working? We do check-ins every day. Great, they feel great. Do they still feel great? No, actually they don't. They feel boring and fake. Oh, well, maybe we should switch that a little bit. 
So we're, what we're focusing on, again, on experience, and it's experience that we're starting to s try to sustain, not the particular forms. And they're, they're useful as they may be. And if they, if they work for 10 years, if our meeting forum works for 10 years, fantastic. If this policy works for 10 years, 20 years, great. We don't have to change it just to be sexy. But if we start to find that there's a disconnect, that disconnect rearing its head, then we, in, we inquire into it. And I think the last thing I'll say is that this also tells us a lot about some of the issues we're having with how to scale. If I say, hey, let's have more schools like that in Baltimore, the first thing people <coughs> start looking at, what's their curriculum? You know, what's their structure? What are those tangible things they're doing? Okay, let's do more of that. And first of all, you'll be missing what they're actually doing that's driving social innovation. And secondly, as you try to import that into some other space, it'll be butting up against the experiences of the people in that other space, their belief systems, their relationships, their ways of thinking. And as soon as you do that, without taking into account their experiences and making this, again, engaged in an experiential way, you often fall flat. Or maybe you've got enough power to force it in, but it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't have the same energy. Um, I think one of the organizations that I love the most in the world, I think illustrates this better than any place I know. This organization in Montreal called Centre Paul Roland, a little Meals on Wheels organization. It's one of the most beautiful places on this planet. It's the greatest teacher I've ever had. This place over now, I think, 15 plus years has just been a, a, a dynamic source of innovation in intergenerational relationships, youth development, um, urban agriculture, um, community building, arts integration, an enormous number of dimensions just come and going. They just attract volunteers and energy without, seemingly without trying. They're well known across the country. Everybody gets a sense of something's going here. People start crying there too if you ask them what's going on here. Whether they spend one week a year there or whether they're full-time staff or board. An amazingly energized and innovative place. And when people started noticing them many years ago, how do you get 200 young volunteers without trying in advertising? We can't do that. They started wanting to copy those forms. You know, say, okay, well, tell us about your volunteer engagement policies. Tell us about the programs. Tell us about how you're doing that. And the organization resisted. Say, ah, it's not really that. We don't really know. We don't really know how we're doing this, but it's not that. We can't tell you that. Over time, they started kind of going deeper into their organizational practices and talking about those and saying, I think it's the way we're related to each other. I think it's kind of the way we're taking each person coming in here as a gift and thinking about the experiences that we're having as we're doing this. And I think that's what's driving our innovation and our ability to be so energized. And that was a tough sell because it's not an easy thing. Okay, how do you spread that? Or how, can we, how do you go give a lecture on that? How do, you, how do we put that in a book? Foundations are struggling with this. But you did start to see changes happening in organizations that were interacting with this organization. As people would leave this organization and go other places, they would carry it with them. Funders started changing because they were funding this organization, literally. Changing the way they were internally <coughs> operating and how they were thinking about other organizations because of their experiences with this organization with Centre for Vermont. And so what you see at the end of the road, at the end of the experiential road, I think, is a whole different way of thinking about social purpose organizations. I'm starting to move away from the idea that a social purpose organization of any kind is just a tool, an instrument for creating change that the people in it are also tools. And starting to think about the organization as itself an expression of the change that it's trying to create. Not something that we're trying to do, but something we're trying to be. Well, we're trying to do it. We're still gonna, we're still gonna develop, deliver our meals. We're still gonna teach the children. We're still gonna advocate for political change and policy change. We're still gonna develop environmental technologies. We're still gonna do all the things we do. But as we're doing them, we're going to try and live out our deepest values so that the outcomes aren't just out there, but that every moment is an outcome. That the organizational life is a fractal, where every little encounter, to some degree, holds that social change in itself. The meetings we go to, the conversations we have in the hallway, the grants we write, the products we make. And as organizations start to do this, I mean, imagine a world filled with organizations like that. You know, schools that feel like a, a places of learning for everybody that's working in them, not just students. Hospitals that feel like places of healing um, and health and vitality for the doctors and the staff and the nurses and the, the neighbors. Community organizations that feel like communities. You 
think about the energy that creates, and more importantly, <coughs> you think about the way that that energy starts to radiate. And this is what we've seen with Sanjay Paulo It starts to change the people who come in contact with it and experience that energy, that value, that purpose for itself. A deep sense of not, sh not a shared understanding of purpose comes out of this, but a shared experience of purpose, which in our you know, own work feels much more, seems much more powerful. A shared experience of purpose. So again, I think that you take an experiential approach, you end up being taking essentially an expressive mode of organizing. And you do change the world. <coughs> what these organizations are claiming, implicitly or explicitly, if we pay attention to each other's experiences as we do this work, we'll change the world. If we pay attention to each other's experiences as we do this work, we will change the world. For me, it's becoming not just some hopeful dream, but some kind of sociological, scientific fact, as you see it in action. There's nothing that I've seen yet that's more exciting to me than that. Some of the best solutions, I think, are always the ones that are the most elegant and the most easily packaged. So I like the way that it's about experience and it's about avoiding being trapped in forms. That's something I can remember. It's something that I can practice. Um, and, and I do think the point about um, the separation of social purpose organizations, uh, exclusively for profit organizations, is something that in thinking about all of this you need to consider the same way that social change organizations need to be thinking about the experience of the people working within them. A for-profit organization with somebody who's working with doesn't like what the organization is doing has more interest in finding out what that ex person's experience is like. What I find very exciting about this is that uh, in, in development I think there's been a kind of shift to this sort of tick box mentality of trying to measure things. We understand that things need to be measured because you can't manage, you know, measure it, you can't manage it, etc., etc. But I think that in that drive, we've really overlooked um, some of the kind of more subtle organizational features that Warren was speaking about in his talk. And you can't measure those things and they're not always tangible. It's really fantastic. Everyone I've spoken to, like, they're just, they've got lots to say. And I think that's a really good indication of um, the fact that, they, you know, he's sort of, uh, these are fertile thoughts, you know, like yeah, that. It's yeah. so exciting. Thanks, Lauren. Okay. We've been using that, uh, your, your techniques, I can say, you know, in which they are good, and because we are there, the people, the experiences of the people, you know. So it's, yeah, it's not new, but it's been inspiring, I can say. When I was listening, I, I just, the, the word that came to mind, and it's something that often comes to mind lately, is just like the, a process of authenticity, you know, where people are really identifying with that and starting to understand that it, you know, just to cut through, the, again, the rhetorical form and, and, and to actually start trying to identify, like, the person behind the system and the person within the system. And we have got this technology to bring about change, sustainable change. And how do you do that when there are so many of these blocks and some of the blocks have been centuries old, like, like you have had, the rest, the, the class, the position in society, the chairman of the, of the corporation. And how do you break down that so that I can access to, I have access to you, to what you think, to what you feel, so that in the same moment I can also explore and expose myself to the same thing. Hence we can have conversation at a lateral level. It brings in a totally different set of conversations um, and ideas and experiences and also changing about where we think we want to go compared to this mental vision of, okay, this is where we want to get to and saying, okay, well, actually in the day-to-day -day business of talking about and living this, we find out that we're actually heading in a slightly different direction than something that's much more real.